morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Um, I first of all want to welcome our visitors, any visitors that are visiting here in person or those who are listening or watching online uh, for the first time. Welcome to you all. My name is Russell, uh, Russell Atkins. I will be filling in here this week uh, while Tim and the crew are up in Nashville at the uh, ACC or AACC or something Association of Christian Counselors. Uh, they're having their national meeting in, in Nashville. We want to wish them well uh, up there. Uh, let's begin uh, with a word of prayer. Eternal Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for a lovely Sabbath day that you've given us to break the humidity and the temperature and coming a fall. I want to ask that you guide our study this morning as we uh, wrap up the Third quarter's lesson, Revival and Reformation. Please guide our study. Please open our hearts. Please uh, keep us teachable. Be with those of our group who are not with us and bring them safely back in the weeks ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned, we are studying the last lesson in the third quarter's uh, study of Revival and Reformation, lesson 13, entitled uh, The Promised Revival, God's Mission Completed. Just as kind of an overview, uh, I, I have really enjoyed um, teaching and studying this uh, quarter's lesson. Uh, I, I think that there were lots of points that were made in each lesson that, um, that we've been able to uh, agree with. You, you know, oftentimes we, we do uh, quarterly bashing in here, and for better or for worse, um, you know, sometimes it needs to be done, and, and sometimes it can feel a little excessive. So, but this <clears throat> this quarter's lesson, and I don't know if many people know who was a principal contributor. Eh? Mark Finley. Finley, yeah, Mark Finley was a principal contributor to this uh, this quarter's lesson. So, uh, I, I job well done. Uh, it it seems like it'd be a thankless task, and, and one that I would not uh, take on. Uh, actually, today I want to begin Friday's lesson. Um, we're going to hopefully start with a big picture approach, and we may narrow our focus down a little bit as we go on. At the bottom of Friday's lesson, there's a green or pink section, um, or a shaded in section. I don't know what color yours is. It doesn't matter. Uh, the first question in the section below is referencing the Ellen White quote in Friday's lesson. It says, Ellen G. White wrote, the message will be carried not so much by argument, as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. In class, discuss what you think this means and what it does not mean. After all, here's the kicker, our message is very logical, very reasonable, and it comes with some very powerful arguments in its favor. How are we to understand then what she is telling us? It, <coughs> I had two questions, two main questions. Number one, is the standard Seventh-day Adventist message logical, reasonable, and filled with powerful arguments? It depends on who's preaching it. Some of it. It depends on who's preaching it. Some of it. Some of it. But when, when you look historically, we go to, I mean, People can come to a, set, a series of meetings, and the information that's presented, it makes sense to the mind, to the, to the intellect. And we have churches full of intellectual conversions. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it speaks to the heart. That doesn't necessarily mean the heart's going to be circumcised. That's correct. Um, growing up in Adventism and the Adventist school system, the message was logical and reasonable to me because it was really the only one I ever heard. Mm. Having heard a different message as presented in this class, the old message does not seem the least bit logical or reasonable. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the concern is it's the concern is twofold. Number one, what do we do about transforming the standard message that is presented in Adventism? 
which is you know uh, approaching a, a penal substitution model that you know Christ had to die because God was angry with sin and therefore God killed him on the cross uh, which is not scriptural which is not logical to any parents out there it's not remotely logical um, and how do we as a class who um, in my opinion have grown beyond that how do we avoid falling into the same trap <coughs> yes it's interesting that um, um, we several of us has grown up in this church and yet we have not grown up in the same church mm -hmm. um, the founder one of the founders of our church Mrs. White we often quote from this in, in this class and it's not the picture that maybe some of us grew up with. And so the church has morphed into a different belief, or at least retained different beliefs as it has amalgamated beliefs from other Christian churches. And so each of us individually have come to this message with a different um, collection of littles a di yeah, a different foundation or a different uh, structure, yeah. Consequently, this church truly may not be the same church it was, and undoubtedly it's not the same church it was 100 years ago or whatever. Sure. So, yeah, that, that's a great point and well said. Um, and I'm going to interrupt here in a minute, or I'm going to interrupt for a minute. Uh, is there anyone that's comfortable running the computer back there so that those who are watching online don't feel left out? Um, of the process it all you do is open up the window and click on the uh, tab and respond uh, or you know tell me any questions that are being asked etc cetera, etc cetera. I think it's pretty easily done is the live stream set up okay thanks Wendell um, well, you know, again, to his point, yes, we all come from different backgrounds. We all come from different, um, uh, subtly different belief systems. Um, hopefully, Jesus of Nazareth is the foundation of those belief systems. But, you know, there was, there was a very different Jesus presented to me uh, and to others uh, in childhood and adolescence and, and college age than, uh, than, I, than I know now. So I, how, do we, how do we as a class avoid falling into the, the trap that I believe our, our church has fallen into? Eve. I think it's important to remain open to continue studying. Um, because if we start saying that we've got it all, mm -hmm. and then we start digging some of the same trenches and you know, attempting to defend those, then we've lost the point. Um, because it's not about whether we're right, it's about focusing on Jesus and God and, and the character of God that Jesus showed us. Thank you, well said. I, I completely agree, yes. When I was um, studying, especially early in college, I, I felt that somehow I needed to syncretize, you know, to sort of get it as close to parallel with all the other Christian faiths as I possibly could, and that somehow that would lead to, you know, the, the central point, the central focus of, of Christianity. Mm -hmm. But what I found was that, um, especially with the mm -hmm. early 70s uh, discussion on righteousness by faith that was going on, there was, there were really severe you know, differences. And um, I, I couldn't, I just couldn't make them work. And um, I mean, that's, that's an oversimplification, obviously. But, you know, the fact is that um, I became discouraged with the way the church was handling some of these very important topics. And I felt that they were just digging the hole into, you know, sectarianism even deeper than they had before mm -hmm. and I couldn't I, I can't go along with that you know I, I feel like if we can't study something 
that we can take out and share with other Christians and be drawn closer rather than driven further apart, something's wrong. <clears throat> right. And I, I, I thank you. I, I agree. The, um, and I experienced some of that same cognitive dissonance as well. And the, the reality is, is that if we present Jesus of Nazareth as, as he's presented in Scripture, as if we develop a relationship with that Jesus and we realize that God is as Jesus revealed him to be, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, then that's, uh, that's, a, great, that's a great place to start, building common ground uh, with the other 33,000 or so sects of Christianity that we have now. Yes? I, I grew up in the message too, in the early age, and my first recollection of evangelistic series was to hit them with Daniel 2, the image. Sure. And it was kind of mind-boggling to uh, people at that stage. Instead of starting them with the life and the love of Jesus Christ first, and then leading into these other things that will determine how this world will end. Well, we still do that. And we, I you know, know. And I Adventism uh, still evangelizes people with beasts and images and, uh, and fear. Fear. And, yes, Lori. Well, and that's when I read this quote, that the message is carried not so much by argument. To me, mm -hmm. the gospel message, or what I've learned, I don't think the gospel message is institutional or denominational, and it's certainly not an argument. It, it, my evangelistic series is telling people what the love of Christ has done in my life, how it's transformed me, how it's changed me, how it's healed me, and what it can do for them. That's not an argument. It just is what it is. Right. Witness. Correct. And yeah, I mean, I think that's my power of evangelism <coughs> within my realm of influence is to share that message, not to try to draw them into a membership of some institution in my experience with being closely associated with other religions, mm -hmm. I've really changed my perspective on that. <clears throat> right. It does not matter what denomination they belong to, ultimately. Uh, that's, that's correct. Uh, you know, uh, God, God wants to save all of humanity. Christ died to save all of humanity, yeah. not just those who consider themselves Christian. Exactly. <clears throat> Well, and my take's a little bit different on that. I mean, you can see people who have good experience with very bad things. And so I think that one of the reasons they take that route is they're trying to address people who maybe don't even believe in the validity of the Bible to begin with. And you have to establish some kind of a reason to believe the Bible's even true. And I think that may be why they start with the prophecies. How, look what they prophesied and look it came true. So start with the foundation of this is a valid book to even be considering. So Jesus could be a valid person to even be considering and then go into the mm -hmm. relationship part. Once a person uh, is convinced mentally that this is a reasonable thing to even think about. I mean, you know, I think that's why. Also, if people are not um, involved with the Bible or Christianity at all, they're possibly more intrigued, mm -hmm. just like the television uses sort of really fascinating titles and stuff to try to even get you there to begin with, where they may not come to something that says learn about Jesus, they may come to see what are these weird things they're talking about, mm -hmm. and that's sort of a uh, attention grabber so that they might even get them there to, to start the conversation. Uh, that's a fair point, and one I hadn't considered, and thank you for bringing it up. Um, <coughs> Yes, yeah, certainly, <clears throat> certainly for the group of people who, who don't, uh, you know, don't, they think the Bible is just a, you know, a great literary reference or a fanciful you know, history document or something like that. Um, the, the evidence of biblical prophecy and, and you know, combined with the world history could, could certainly be a, uh, an attraction, an enticement. Um, but you do fail if you then don't. <laughs> don't close the circle, I'm saying, and, and well, you you you, the you you fail if you don't if you don't look at biblical prophecy through the lens of Jesus Christ. Okay, if you try to make Jesus fit into the Old Testament 
God or, or the Old Testament sanctuary system, or if you try to make Jesus fit into Old Testament prophecy, you can wind up with a very distorted picture of Jesus. Okay? And I'm going to suggest that those who have rejected Christianity have been presented that distorted picture of Jesus, either in uh, behavior or uh, word. And they've rejected it outright. Say, so, okay, no Jesus, no God, done. And who could blame them? All right, Sabbath's lesson. Uh, the title, Promised Revival, God's Mission Completed. What is God's mission? That was my first question when I opened the book. What was God's mission? Has it already been completed, or is it something yet to be done? Speak up, please. Something yet to be done. Wendell? Jesus said that he came to reveal the Father mm -hmm. and that he had accomplished the work that was given to him. Mm -hmm. And so something was completed. At Calvary, I agree. I Any other thoughts? I think his mission was completed at that time and then it became our mission. And that has yet to be completed through the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Christ's mission was completed. Uh, yeah, and we have one yet to fulfill. But he had more than one mission. Um, yes. You know, he said that he came to seek and to save the lost. Mm -hmm. And they're still lost. So that mission yes. is, not, is not completed. Right. Um, you know, I mean, not that there's not going to be any lost, but they're still savable people. Mm -hmm. um, and so his mission continues. That's the, possibly the one they're talking about that will be completed. Right. Yes. I can just say that just because his mission was, was to reveal God, but I revealed a new software application to someone, that doesn't necessarily mean that they understand that software application. I've exposed them to it. Mm -hmm. So he exposed the world to the true God, dispelling what Satan had proposed as who God was. And now it's our responsibility to make sure the whole world understands that God of love. That's our, at first, it's our responsibility to understand it for ourselves. Yeah, uh, correct. Right. And experience, you know, to delve into the software and to uh, know our way around the software and develop a relationship with the software, uh, to use the analogy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we can teach other people how to use the software. Yes. Someone online mentioned that um, he has already convinced the universe of who he is and what God is like, and now it's it's convincing us is ongoing. Right, humanity are are the only known intelligences in the universe that have yet to make up their minds. Yeah, because at Calvary, the angels, the the intelligent worlds, their minds were set. Was, oh, okay, Satan's a liar and a murderer. Done. Continuing with the thought that she had um, about Christ's mission is to save everyone, and that's not complete yet. It's unfortunate that, you know, I mean, this next quarter we're going to be starting studying about the sanctuary. And it's unfortunately that so much of our conversation about the sanctuary is about judgment mm -hmm. and conviction and whatnot, and not about saving the lost. Right. Correct. Well said. And I don't envy you next week. Usually I get the first lesson of the quarter. <laughs> and now I get the last. <laughs> the memory text, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Um, I want to read through Sabbath's lesson, uh, just because there, you know, I had some questions and, and issues. The challenge of preaching the gospel in the context of the three angels' messages to the entire world may seem impossible. Although the Seventh-day Adventist church is growing rapidly, is it? Is our church growing rapidly? It's not keeping up with world growth. Yeah, he makes that point, but I mean, I, I wasn't aware our church was growing rapidly. I thought, it was, I thought it was declining in North America. Okay, so all right, all right. It's not keeping up with the population. There are multiple areas of the world where the name Seventh-day Adventist, much less our message, is not known. Is that a bad thing? The word, the, the term Seventh-day Adventist is not known? Yeah, that's bad. Is it? 
Yeah. Okay. Propose that it's a love of God that's not known as the important thing. Thank you. I concur. We don't want to be like the Pharisees and, and you know, have it said of us that you know, we search the world over for a convert and then make them twice the son of hell as they were before. It's God's appointed the church. Is it? Sure. Acts 4.12, there's no other name under heaven whereby we may be saved. It's not Seventh-day Adventist. That's right. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Um, the reality of this harsh fact leads to some serious questions. Is it possible for the gospel to be preached to the entire world in this generation? Will there be some unusual breakthrough that will dramatically speed up the proclamation of the three angels' message? There's all, there is always one thing to keep in mind when we discuss this topic. The mission is God's, and he will accomplish it. At the same time, however, we must remember that we've been called to do a crucial role in our final work as well. Again, does it matter which gospel is being presented? If we present a destructive gospel, is that going to be shared as really great news versus we share a, a really good news gospel, a, a gospel that God is exactly as Jesus revealed him to be and that God didn't kill his son on the cross and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that... that that to me is is worth sharing. That that, that I'm almost unconstrained Amen. to uh, to keep it quiet. Uh, the other gospel that I was raised with, I I just didn't really find it great news at the time, and I it's less so now. Yes, sir. A life lived in in the truth of of what what we we know. We do volumes. That's right. To to what the world knows, and that's you know Jesus to Thomas said, "You believe because you see, but blessed is he that believes without seeing." Mm -hmm. And I think that was a blessing on the final generation that will give the truth to the world that the world will see, and then they'll believe. Right. And then wasn't that God's intent for the for the children of Israel when He brought them out of when He brought them out of Egypt? You know, he, he, gave them a, he gave them a health message. He gave them a sanctuary message. He gave them a, um, he gave them a law carved on stone. He, gave them, he set them apart. And, and let me tell you, folks, the, the heathen that were surrounding them observed this. And they said, and they say, hmm, these guys, these guys' clothes don't fall off. They're, they don't have any diseases we do. There must be something, you know, their, their God is fighting for them. And the, the heathen these nations trembled. And that, that was God's way of getting their attention and hopefully arresting them in their, in their path to destruction. But the children of Israel singly failed to, to fulfill that mission. So God took it and gave it to others. Okay? And I believe the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the current version of the children of Israel. And if we fail in our, if I, we fail in our mission, he's going he's gonna to let, let it go it's going to go forward. Someone else is going to have the privilege of doing it. Yes. I just think it's important to remember that although it is important what we share, it is more important that we remember that the Holy Spirit is going to do the work mm -hmm. regardless of how much work or how little work we do. Um, you could look at the five loaves and the fishes. That mm -hmm. was a small amount that because of the Holy Spirit, you could argue, fed a lot of people. So... A small witness, a small testimony, because of the Holy Spirit will do the work, you do not have to do the work. You were never going to be able to do the work in the first place. Right. No, that's correct. You know, we, we may be anywhere along the continuum. We may be the seed planter. We may be watering the seed. We may be pruning the leaves. We may be, um, you know, <coughs> harvesting the fruit. We may be keeping the insects away. Who knows what part of the process we're going to be involved in with that, um, you know, the seed in the ground germinating into a plant and fruit analogy. Yes. But I think the important point, though, is that we have to be involved. Yes. And we can't say, oh, you know. We're sitting back in our lawn chair. Because the Holy Spirit's going to do things. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, under the umbrella with a glass of tea, watching it grow. Yeah, that, that's not going to happen. Um, again, my question, wasn't, wasn't God's... 
original mission was to restore mankind in his, to his or her own nobility uh, as it was after creation. And to restore a correct understanding of God in man's heart and mind. Wasn't it to have God, mankind in harmony with his law of love? Unselfish, kind, living out his perfect law in heart, mind, and behavior? Didn't he accomplish this a little over 2,000 years ago? In, in, the, in the being that we know as Jesus? If he did, then what's left for God to do? The healing process. Yeah, he's, still, oh, he's absolutely still involved in the healing process. And they are both interceding. Yes. Us and against the destructive power of sin. Yes. The, Correct. The reality of what he did being exemplified in the lives of people. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to be completed. After God returns again, uh, after Christ returns again for the second time, will God's mission be completed or will he still be working? He'll still be working. What will he be doing? After what? Then? After Christ's second coming, after, after it's all done, after the wicked or after the third coming even, after you know, the wicked are destroyed, New Jerusalem's set up on earth, um, thousand years after that, is God going to be bored? Is he going to, I'm done, what, what do I do now? He'll still be showing his love for us. He, Wendell. During the millennium, I don't understand this, but in, in the description of the, the New Jerusalem, it talks about the leaves of the tree of the life being for the healing of the nations. Mm -hmm. Something's ongoing. Some growth and healing and whatnot will be ongoing during even those who have um, experienced heaven. Uh, I think it's a great point. And I agree with you. I think there's going to be a lot of growth and healing that will occur for that thousand years. And now. Frank, frankly, I think we're going to spend the first three or four hundred years apologizing to one another. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, we're going to be, you know, our neighbors are going to be people that we have gossiped about, that we have committed adultery uh, on or with, that we have uh, stolen from. I mean, those people are going to be there and people that have offended us. We're going to, I think we're going to spend a lot of time apologizing to one another. It might not take that long. <laughs> and then again, it might. <laughs> I hope it doesn't, but <laughs> I'm not sure I share your optimism. Um, Sunday's lesson, the promised power. Uh, referencing, again, the title of Sunday's lesson. What is the, quote, power spoken of uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you? This is... Um, this is referencing uh, where are we? Uh, Acts one eight, I believe. Yes, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What is the power that uh, Christ was talking about? It, it is the Holy Spirit, but what is the power of the Holy Spirit? To be able to witness. <clears throat> Say it louder, please. The power of the Holy Spirit is love and truth. The Holy Spirit is also known as the Spirit of love and the Spirit of truth. Okay? What's so powerful about love? It casts out all fear. It casts out fear. It destroys hatred. Is that powerful? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Cast out selfishness, too. It, it, it removes selfishness. What's the power of, of um, truth? It destroys lies. It destroys lies. It brings light into a darkened world. Yes. So this, this power, uh, the power to transform character, I believe, is what uh, Christ was talking about. I don't think he's talking about the power to, to do miracles or the power to uh, cast out devils or the power to do... Um, you know, transport yourself from one place to another without walking. Is, is fear not the strongest motivating factor that we as humans know, for the most part? Uh, I, it's probably one of the strongest in our carnal nature. 
in our in our untransformed character, yeah. But love love is going to dispel that. The true love of God. Love is yeah. dispelling that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You look happy. Several years ago, uh, for my birthday, I bought several books on prayer. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was written by uh, a guy named Andrew Murray, who I think was originally from South Africa and spent a good part of his years in Scotland and England, you know, Great Britain and so on. And he wrote some absolutely magnificent books. And the book that I'm referring to specifically is actually a, a devotional book. But in, in sort of uh, boiling it all down to a phrase, the object of prayer is to come into a relationship with God that is built totally and strictly on love and trust and, you know, an immediate connection because of your heart of love for God and what you've accepted of His love. And, and I'll tell you something, <laughs> for me at least, that has been very... That, that, that is a, a process that requires a lot of time and a lot of um, intense effort. Mm -hmm. yeah. Otherwise, it, you know, it's like, it's like taking somebody for granted. It's like being, you know, uh, not, not connected well enough. Thank you. Uh, someone look up Galatians 5, 22 and 23. These are, should be familiar texts. It's talking about the fruits of the Spirit. Um, again, I, I want to continue to focus, you know, it, as humans, we, when we hear power, we think, uh, ooh, 600 horsepower car, or, um, you know, a 100 foot tidal wave, or a F category uh, 5 hurricane, you know, those are powerful. But, um, you know, the, the way God wields power, or, or the, even the power of God, is something vastly different, and I want to explore that a little more. Galatians 5, 22, 23. Whoever has it, just shout it out, please. But the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There's no law against such things as these. Thank you. Think of, ponder on those for a minute. Think about how powerful joy is, how powerful peace is and love. And think about how powerful self-control is, and especially in this day and age. When you see people that are self-possessed and under self-control, uh, despite uh, circumstances that uh, should make them lose their control, it, it's powerful. It makes you stop and, and look. It makes you stop and wonder, hmm, and know what they know. Which is more powerful here, uh, you know, thermonuclear destruction or the creation of life? Love or hate, which is more powerful? Uh, Selfishness or selflessness? Selfless. Death or life? Life. Disease or healing? Healing. Healing. I mean, all, all of these, th you know, all of these things come from God. The, the more powerful of the two come from God. Um, I think it's the second paragraph. In Sunday's lesson, no matter how challenging the task, the promises of God are sure. Jesus' statement that, quote, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world as the witness to nations and in the end will come is a promise. The proclamation of the gospel to the entire world may seem impossible, but God's power will overcome every obstacle. Every, power, every person on the planet will have a reasonable opportunity to hear and understand God's message of love and truth before the return of our Lord. Uh, I think it's well said. And... I, I want to reemphasize it still matters which gospel is being presented. Uh, Monday's lesson, the early and the latter rain. Uh, it, it, for me, it seems to make sense that God would provide some sort of, you know, a sensible illustration for humanity um, since he's known from the beginning how long this entire process is going to take. I mean, have you ever have you ever stopped and consider that that even before the creation of the world, God knew the exact date that the gospel would be preached to all the world. He knew the exact date that Christ would die. He knew the exact date that, that uh, Christ would return again. He knows exactly how many people will accept 
salvation and healing and he knows their names. He's already built them a you know, room in his house. He knows the number of hairs on their heads. I mean, have you ever stopped to ponder all that? He knew how many people were going to get into the ark? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> or he would have made a fleet of them. Correct. <laughs> um, you know, this, some of these things, you stop and ponder this, it, it gets a little mind-boggling. But, I mean, he's, he's known from the beginning what the process would be and how long it would take and what it would involve. And so it makes sense to me that he provides some sort of illustration for us, you know, like you know, in an agrarian uh, economy, the early and the latter rain. You know, the early rain in the in October time when, when uh, you know, seeds are being planted, you know, to, to, to water the seed, and then the latter rain in the spring when you know, it was grown and it's near harvest time. It tells us what happens in between. Yes. Those stairs. That's right. The seed has to die before it, you know, becomes a plant. And then, you know, an enemy comes and sows, uh, sows weeds. Yeah, he, he, tells, he tells us the whole process. Um, I guess the real question right now is, is are, we, are we receiving the latter rain right now or are we hindering it? Thoughts? Some places. One more time. Some places. Some places. Yes. Some places are receiving it, and some are hindering it. Is that? Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Other thoughts? Well, if there's if there's an outpouring of the latter rain, there has to be some kind of a counterfeit going on too. You know, I mean, Satan's not going to leave it leave it alone. One would think, yes. So. Is it possible that it could just be on an individual basis? Well, I, I, think, I think that's where it starts. You know, what are churches made up of? Churches are made up of individuals. You know, the, uh, several weeks ago, I read a quote that it only takes one person mm -hmm. uh, for a revival to, to take place, and that person is asking for the Holy Spirit and, and being transformed, and that lights a fire amongst everyone around them. And so it, it is an individual process, but it is not an island individual. Right. It's Look at Jesus, the individual. Look at the fire he lit. Yeah. Uh, this is a quote from Christ's Object Lessons, page 66. Bear with me, it's a bit lengthy. The plant grows by receiving that which God has provided to sustain life. It sends down its roots into the earth, it drinks in the sunshine, the dew and the rain. It receives the life-giving properties from the air. So the Christian is to grow by cooperating with the divine agencies. Feeling our helplessness, we are to improve all the opportunities granted us to gain a fuller experience. As the plant takes root in the soil, so we are to take deep root in Christ. As the plant receives the sunshine, the dew and the rain, we are to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit. In other words, we are to be teachable. The work is to be done, quote, not by might nor by power, but, my, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, referencing Zechariah 4, 6. If we keep our minds stayed upon Christ, he will come to us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain in the, of the earth. As the son of righteousness, and son and righteousness are capitalized, uh, he will arise upon us with healing in his wings, uh, referencing Malachi 4, 2. We shall, quote, grow as the lily, we shall revive as the corn, and grow as the vine. By constantly relying upon Christ as our personal Savior, we shall grow up into him in all things who is our head. The wheat develops first as the blade, then as the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. The object of the husbandman is sowing the seed, and the culture of growing the plant is the production of grain. He desires bread for the hungry and seed for future harvests. So the divine husbandman looks for a harvest as the reward of his labor and sacrifice. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men. Let me read that again. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men, and he does this through those who believe in him. The object of the Christian life is fruit-bearing. 
and the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer that it may be reproduced in others. Any thoughts? Uh, are these cyclic? You know, uh, we talked about the early rain, the latter rain. Is, is that an annual thing or a semi-annual thing? Are we talking about generations? Are we talking about world events? Most of the time, it seems to me, we think of this as a world event that all of a sudden something's going to happen to everybody mm -hmm. and we're going to be aware of it. I don't know how it's going to work, but it doesn't seem to be that way. When, when uh, I, 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 I face with people who seem to have a particular view that is, is loving and kind, they get shot down. Mm -hmm. And it irritates me no end. And, and we, wa we wonder how in the world is the Lord going to solve all this problem? Because, you know, we've got, uh, how many people we got here from the ages of maybe 20 to 80 or 90 in here? Oh, we've heard this. <laughs> the people who are older have heard this over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it's been written time and time again. Nothing seems to change. You know, we, uh, World War I, that was the end of the world. Right. World War II, it's coming now. Korea, oh, now we got the Far East as a mess. You know, <coughs> what's, uh, uh, it's always a crisis. And, and, and uh, our, our religion seems to not be able to handle it. We just, we, we, we talk about these things as though it's just going to happen. And oh, all of a sudden, Christ is going to be coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, these are all good questions. I, uh, I would well imagine that when the references of the early rain and latter rain were given, uh, that there were places on earth that were desert and that didn't receive, receive much rain at all in October or in springtime, in fall or spring. They probably didn't receive an early rain or a latter rain. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a great, uh, I don't have a great answer to any of those questions. I think they're good, valid questions that we should be pondering, but I don't have a great answer for them. Yes, Wendell. Responding to the the thought of when will Christ come and whatnot, I imagine that when Noah was preaching for 120 years, that it, it looked quite abysmal mm -hmm. and in fact when he ended up his sojourn of preaching he only had six including himself and um, you know six I thought it was eight uh, eight I'm sorry six he, is his yeah he and his wife yeah his mm -hmm. wife. Um, so you know to me Christ said as it was in the days of Noah Things will have accomplished. When the boat was done, it could have happened at any point. There, there's a message that, that God would like to have to the world. There's other things that are happening, that, some of which, you know, many of which we do not know. Right. But when those have accomplished, you know, Christ will come in a day when you think not. Like a thief. Yes. I've always thought that uh, God's going to get as many people in the kingdom as he can. As, as long as the numbers are in the positive, but as soon as he sees that they're, they're starting to roll backwards, I think that's when he's going to come. Well, I, I certainly agree that I think, I think God wants, you know, as many people, you know, God's not willing that one be lost. I, 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 can't, I can't argue with that at all. Um, I just got a text from, from um, Nashville, and uh, the latter rain maybe is starting in Nashville. Uh, Tim is uh, is presenting uh, several things there, and also making his book available. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have sold uh, ten times more books than the publisher expected. Praise the Lord! Yeah. Good. And um, and Tim and Christy send their greetings to the class here in Collegedale. Good. Thanks. I'm, I'm glad things are going well up there in the back. I don't know how all this ties in. 
but this fire that took place on the boardwalk in New Jersey, mm -hmm. when it first started, they didn't think they needed that much help because they didn't see what was all going on. But apparently there was a fire on top and underneath. So I think a lot of times things can be happening that we don't even realize are happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that we just need to realize we have to be dependent on God and that it's going to happen. But those firemen, they thought they could handle it. And then it became a two alarm, a three alarm, a four mm -hmm. alarm, five alarm, I think up to a six alarm fire because so much was happening that they couldn't see. And I think that God in his wisdom has a lot more going on than we realize. But we right. have to have the faith that it's going to happen and it is happening. And we have... Uh you know, I was noticing on some of the comments uh, online that um, there was a high percentage of people blaming that on God's wrath for the Jersey Shore television show on MTV. Uh, I mean, you're familiar with that, but it's a reality show that shows 20-somethings getting and staying drunk for an entire summer. Um, so there's still that mentality out there that, that you know, flooding in Colorado is God's wrath for... Mm -hmm. Recalling, you know, two gun control, you know, two gun control legislators, and and you know, Hurricane Sandy's God's wrath for this, that, and the other, and Hurricane Katrina's God's wrath for something else. Yeah. <laughs> There's still that mentality out there. Hang on, Eve, you had your hand up. Um, you know, back when Jesus came, they were expecting something different. Yes. And so they didn't recognize him when he came. And Jesus told us that we're going to be going about our lives as normal. It's going to surprise us. And yet we keep preaching about the latter rain as if it's something that we're going to see and notice. Mm -hmm. So that we can just jump right on and, and take part. I don't think it's going to happen that way. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be something that, that God works among his people. And sure. a lot of people aren't going to recognize it. They're not going to, they're not going to see it because it's not what they're expecting. Right. Yeah, and... and uh, to, you know, to, to take that point a step further, um, if, if Satan was at one time able to present a false god concept to a group of chosen people so much and do it so, so cleverly and so uh, efficiently and effectively that, that when God actually came, they murdered him, uh, <clears throat> isn't it reasonable to expect something like that again? Oh, absolutely. Lori? So I agree with that. I mean, all ten virgins were sleeping. Yes. You know what I mean? But what I was going to say, another thing, a perspective change this class has brought me is I often, some of the illogic and the irrational stuff that, that we were taught, I, think, I used to think how in the world, because I thought the gospel message was the Adventist message, how in the world could every human on the planet have heard this, you know what I'm saying? That just seemed like an unrealistic proposition. Right. But what I've learned in this class, the fact that every person alive will be presented with the opportunity to choose love over selfishness, you know what I'm saying? Or Christ decide to give up themselves for others versus saving self. Mm -hmm. That's completely realistic. Yes, absolutely. You know I mean? Yeah, and you know the scripture, t scripture indicates that there will be those in, in heaven who you come up to Jesus, hey, how, how are you? Who are you? And shake your hand. Hey, what happened to your hand? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Linda? I had been looking for texts that pertain to earlier parts of our class and finally found them. The quote that you mentioned earlier and kind of goes to her is, you travel the land and sea to win a single convert. When he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's talking... That yeah. they are a son of hell and they're going to do that. Yes, and exactly. To the person that they're mm -hmm. trying to convert. That's found in Matthew 23, 20, yeah. 15. And then the other one, i sorry about this like jumping. Thing, no, no, no problem. But it really speaks to what you're saying. In Luke 1, Zechariah sang. Zechariah had a, was filled with the Holy Spirit when his son was born. Mm -hmm. And I love what he prophesied about what Jesus' mission was. This is John the Baptist's father. John the yeah. Baptist's father, Zechariah. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke 1, starting at verse 67, going to 75. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come. He's redeemed his people. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he has said through his holy prophets of long ago salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us 
to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear mm -hmm. in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for uh, going, going back and look. Part. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, Tuesday's lesson, what are the prerequisites for the latter rain? Well, my first question, what were the prerequisites for the early rain? And this is from Acts, basically from the chapters, Acts, Acts chapters 1 and 2. The, uh, the, early, the early church, the disciples, uh, um, after Christ had, had left them, what was, what, were their, what was their attitude? What was their mentality? I, I listed a couple of things here. Anybody want to? They were together, all together in one accord. Okay, they were physically together. Were they, were they together in any other way? They were in unity of purpose. They were waiting for it. They were asking for it. They were. They had a uh, yeah teachable prayer, uh, uh, teachable spirit. They believed what was told them was true. Mm -hmm. They uh, had a unity of God's knowledge of God's character as revealed by Jesus. They were sharing resources with one another. Was there any unity of doctrine or denomination? Did they even know what a denomination was? Well, they, they were Jewish, as far as they were concerned. They were still Jewish. I uh, yes, I think there were some Greeks uh, around as well, but <coughs> yeah, predominantly Jewish. And I think it was the first time they ever realized that they had finally gotten it, even after all the years they spent with Jesus, that uh, he wasn't going to set up a kingdom on their behalf, and that their their uh, ultimate goal would be to spread the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. That was certainly starting to sink in, no question about it. Uh, my, might it make sense that the prerequisites for the early rain and the latter rain haven't really changed? No. I mean, does, that, does that sound reasonable? The prerequisites are the same? <clears throat> Isn't God still waiting on a people to fully reveal the power, as we talked about in Sunday's lesson, the power of a transformed heart and, a, and heart and mind? Is he waiting on a people unwilling to keep his power to themselves and build a fortification of doctrines to protect their, quote, truth? This is, uh, this is from the Review and Herald, July 21, 19, uh, excuse me, 1896. The great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with his glory, will not come until we have an enlightened people, but know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. When we have an entire wholehearted consecration to the service of Christ, God will recognize the fact by an outpouring of his spirit without measure. But this will not be while the largest portion of the church are not laborers together with God. God cannot pour out his spirit when selfishness and self-indulgence are so manifest. When his spirit prevails that, if put into words, would express that answer of Cain, quote, am I my brother's keeper? The lesson states that uh, all spiritual revival and genuine reformation lead to a passionate desire to witness. Uh, I, I agree, but I would take it a step further. I, I would say that we cannot help but witness when we are uh, under genuine revival and genuine reformation. We, we are unconstrained to witness. Yes? One of the most um, troubling, if you will, or, or even... Um, introspective thoughts that I've, I've ever read, I think, in, in uh, any of Ellen White's writings, especially I'm you know, thinking of the, the conflict series, was that the people, even God's people, before the flood, she said, had come to regard things in almost the same light as the people who were not of God. And so you got to ask yourself, you know, how much closer to the world's point of view have nominal Christians or, you know, God's people, so to speak, come, you know, to mm -hmm. that, that type of thinking. Mm -hmm. 
And, and I, I really honestly believe that this class is, is confronting that issue or that kind of an issue right. here. It's that profound. I hope so. Wednesday's lesson, the baptism of fire, in third paragraph. The symbolism of fire is a symbol of the glory, presence, and power of God manifest in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. To be baptized with fire is to be immersed in the glory of God's presence, uh, I agree, through the Holy Spirit in order to witness in his power. Moses met God at the burning bush and then left the glory of his presence in order to witness to Pharaoh. Elijah witnessed to Israel in the glory of God's fiery presence on, on Mount Carmel. And when tongues of fire fell on Pentecost, the disciples witnessed in, witnessed in languages they had never before known. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is immersion in the presence and power of God in order that we may be, we can effectively witness of his glory. Once again, in the last days of Earth's history, God's people will be immersed in his presence, filled with his power, and sent out to witness, sent out to witness of his glory to the world. I think this is a very powerful paragraph, especially if you take it to its reasonable conclusion uh, and apply it to the destruction of the unrighteous. Right. And his glory is his character. His character of love is the same thing as, as what his power is. You know, and, that's, and that's correct. Our witness to that is his character in us. Mm -hmm. You know, won't, won't every human eventually be baptized with the uh, fire of God's presence? Yes. Everyone will eventually be baptized with it. Whether, whether they've done it on earth slowly under the umbrella of his grace or whether it's done abruptly at the very end, they will be baptized with his presence. Wendell. There's an online comment that the return of Christ and the baptism of the Spirit may be a surprise to everyone just in the fact that those who are following and trusting in Christ will not think that they are ready. And they haven't met the goal. Hmm. Good point. Well said. Thank you. Uh, a couple minutes here left. Let's take a, a look at Thursday's lesson, and that may be a first. I covered the whole thing. <laughs> the great controversy ended. Uh, the lesson suggests that the book of, Revelation can, book of Revelations can be summed up thusly. Quote, Jesus wins, Satan loses. <laughs> Is that... Is that the summation of Revelations for you guys? I'm going to suggest it's summed up that God is love, Amen. just like the rest of Scripture. Um, in the first paragraph, here is good news. The same Jesus who defeated Satan on the cross will come back again and triumph over the powers of hell and put a full end to evil. Evil will not have the last word. Poverty and pestilence will not have the last word. Sickness and suffering will not have the last word. Chaos and crime will not have the last word. And disease and death will not have the last word. And still God will. Amen. What will God's last word be? Amen. Okay, will it be up yours, wicked? Told you. <laughs> no. Would it be, is it hot in here or is it just me? <laughs> okay, this, this is, these are... This is what uh, much of Christianity presents. <laughs> you know, is he going to, yeah, with a yell, you know, burn, burn, burn? No, it's not. You know, he's going to say, Satan, I love you very much, and I will miss you. Think about it. Every second of every day, we're all witnesses to something. We're either witnesses to what destruction does or we're witnesses to what God does to undo the destruction. We're always a witness. Correct. Right. That's right. One, one last comment. We'll close the prayer. I heard a pastor who lived in Kernersville quote that Christ will never come until there is a complete revival and reformation within the church. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the revelations of your character uh, of truth and love and freedom as given to us in the example of Jesus of Nazareth. 
uh, I want to ask that you continue to pour out your Holy Spirit on this class, both collectively and individually, uh, so that we will be unconstrained. We will be powerless to resist the, the um, uh, our witness. We will we will be compelled to share it with uh, all who will listen. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.